Reggie's on it? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the board at Climate Group, Joan McNaughton. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Business Hub. It's a great pleasure to have you here. I hope you're finding that it is rewarding in terms of the content and the session, but the clue is in the name, it's a hub. And I hope you're also getting great benefit from the networking opportunities. We're now going to make you work quite hard uh, because we're going to be talking about, in this session, facilitating investments towards a 1.5 degree future. We know that to get there requires a major shift in investment patterns away from fossil fuels and into clean energy. You all know that as well as I do. I think what a lot of people don't realize is just how important it's going to be for the private sector, both the finance sector and uh, the developers, the project deliverers, to produce that investment. Some people have said that could be as much as 90% of the investment needed. Governments can't do it. They don't have the balance sheets. And actually, I was 35 years in government, but I don't think they should even try. The private sector 
is better at acting quickly and it's better at taking decisions on resource allocation, actually, including discarding things that don't work and seizing on innovation opportunities. So um, we need the private sector. We need governments to set the framework to enable the private sector to act, and increasingly we're seeing that they're doing that. One of the key actors will be the pension funds, and we're going to be exploring that, among other things, this afternoon. And we have incredibly talented speakers and panelists to guide us through this complex area. So I'd like to introduce first our keynote speaker, my friend, Dr. Barbara Bushner, who's the Executive Director of the Climate Finance Programme at the Climate Policy Initiative, and who also directs the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. This is known as The Lab. And when it was launched, many of us wondered what it would do that was different. Well, it's mobilized something like two billion dollars over two years. So I think it's already more than justified uh, its existence. And I think that in large part is due to the leadership of Barbara and her colleagues. She's the author of several um, really influential reports on uh, financing, on clean financing. Uh, and she has many, many other um, achievements to her name. But I'm not going to spend time going through all of those because I think when you hear her speak, that will speak for itself. So Barbara, it's a pleasure to welcome to the podium. Well, thank you so much, Joan, and thank you so much to the Climate Group for having me here. It's a true pleasure. And uh, welcome, welcome all of you uh, to fa facilitating investments into a 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius future. Welcome, in other words, to the edge of a cliff. This picture from my homeland, Austria. In the midst of the Alps in a resort, visitors can walk across a suspension bridge to get to the stairway to nothingness, where they can stand and take in the whole world at the edge of the Dachstein Gletscher. Is my homeland beautiful? But resorts like this are starting to lose business, and even close, as warmer seasons imply that glaciers are receding. Over the last decade, glaciers have lost 350 meters. That is almost the height of the Empire State Building. And every year, they've started losing more and faster. In 2018, five of the costliest climate, climate disasters, including the campfire in California, Hurricane Michael in, uh, in Cuba and in the east coast of the US, and Typhoon JB, have totaled economic losses of 67.5 billion US dollars. That is 70 times the amount that New York spends every year on roads and on transit infrastructure. And that is only the beginning. Right now, we're on track for a three degrees global warming scenario. And that would imply that you're changing every major aspect of the world as we know it. Just put simply, wildfires, droughts, floods, in an increasing intensity over the next 60 years would force more and more people to leave their homes. But I'm not trying to scare you. Instead, I'm asking you, as you're picturing yourself financing a 1.5 degrees future, to imagine for a moment that you stand here at the edge of the world. You might be scared or worried because of the height and the potential drop, particularly if you, like, if you don't like heights. But at the same time, you might be deeply moved by the amazing view of the mountains. The truth is that I would not be here today speaking to you if I only saw the edge of a cliff or if I only saw the risks. 
I've worked in this field for many years because I see a horizon, because I see a real opportunity to invest in a future that is better for the people and better for the planet. And I believe that investors, experts like you here in the room really are key in driving this. I lead an uh, analytical organization uh, called Climate Policy Initiative. We work with governments, with financial institutions and businesses in order to drive economic growth while addressing climate change. We are known for tracking sustainable investment trends, for identifying innovative business models, and for driving and supporting solutions that really can make a low-carbon climate resilient future a reality. So where are we in terms of investment? We've been uh, looking and tracking investments into climate action since 2011. Over the last eight years, we have seen steady increases of both public and private investments into climate action. We're going to release our new figures for 2017 and 2018 in a few weeks, and we can see that for the first time, we will hit the half trillion US dollars mark. Actually, we will surpass it quite significantly. So what is behind these trends? Certainly, let me start with the public side. I mean, Joan briefly mentioned it. I think we've seen a lot of momentum on the public side, and this week particularly, we've seen a lot of additional uh, commitments and announcements through the summit and before. But just look, let me look back a little bit. In 2013, the World Bank started, stopped basically the financing of coal-fired plants. And six years later, they extended that to all fossil fuel extraction, while at the same time really increasing investments into green purposes. But more importantly, and again what we've seen this week, is that the main um, the, the main trend at the moment is mainstreaming, is aligning. We've seen that 33 of the large, uh, world's largest development finance institutions that represent a total balance sheet of over 11 trillion US dollars have committed to mainstreaming and aligning their entire portfolios with the Paris Agreement. At the same time, if you look at the private side, Again, we've seen some incredible announcements this week. I want to call out the alliance, um, the announcement by Alliance, one of the creation of one of the biggest alliances of pension funds and insurers that have committed to making their portfolios carbon neutral by 2050. You've seen BlackRock in their latest report showing that 760 billion of their assets actually are now invested into targeted sustainability funds in the US and in Europe. At the same time, we've seen lots of banks uh, really stepping up in their action. And again, we've seen in the last few days 130 banks signing the sustainable investment, responsible investment uh, principles, uh, and in this way, again, showing that they would want to be accountable. I think more importantly, however, we need much more, and I agree with Joan here. We know that institutional investors are actually asking regulators to lead the way on climate risk disclosure in a way that they better understand of what climate uh, assets are at risk and how they can really shift their assets towards greener purposes. So we've seen a lot of progress and we've seen a lot of commitments, but all that entails that the real question is pipeline. And I think this is where innovation comes into play. While energy, uh, the energy sector in particular certainly needs quite some innovation uh, in the storage space, I think what is most striking to me is that the business models that have been driving this growth trend in climate investments are not the business models of the past. And industries that have been stagnant for decades are disrupted by new players. As Joan briefly said, at CPI we are running a, a program that is called the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. The lab brings together investors from the public and private space, from governments, from development finance institutions, from commercial banks, from institutional investors and other private sector organizations. And the lab's goal is to unlock private investment at scale for climate change, clean energy and other sustainable investment purposes. In a little over four years, actually, it was not two years, we have managed to develop uh, 35 and new financial solutions and businesses that collectively have mobilized almost two billion US dollars for concrete projects across mitigation and adaptation around the world. So the lab really identifies, develops and launches sustainable investment solutions that can address the barriers, particularly private investment in the market and at the same time attract real investment. But notwithstanding all the, all the um, 
sorry, that was too quick. Notwithstanding all the progress that we've seen in innovation, in actual investment, in political will, certainly also in awareness, as you've seen this week again, we are falling far short of where we need to be. Some scientists uh, continue to you know, indicate that if we want to hit the 1.5 degree target, then we need emissions, global emissions to peak in 2020. That is less than a year away. The opportunity is here. If you look at what globally low carbon growth could deliver, it's in the size of 26 trillion US dollars of economic benefits. And that is a conservative estimate. If you just think about the scale of this opportunity, 26 trillion is the combined annual GDP of the US, Canada, India, and Brazil. This is a huge opportunity. So this is why, when I look at this picture, I don't only see the risk. I see a huge opportunity here. We stand at the cliff today, but we have much of the innovation, we have much of the capital, we have much of the knowledge and of the real political will to do things. But we need to do it quickly and we need to do it at scale. And I think more importantly, we can't do this alone. This challenge is too big. We need to do this together. So while I'm standing there, it's actually not me, but while I'm standing there at the cliff, what I would like to do here is inviting all of you to join me on that cliff. But let's not look down. Let's look out there to the amazing few, to those of us who really want to build something sustainable. Thanks so much. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so I don't know if we're all going to fit on that little glass platform, but we know what the challenge is that we see ahead of us. However, we have some guides and friends who are going to uh, help to identify the opportunities uh, and how we might take advantage of them. And firstly, I'd like to ask uh, Jason Ace, who is the executive director at Vivid Economics, to set the scene for that first panel, which is how can companies harness investment opportunities and leverage portfolios for a net zero future. He's going to explain what Vivid Economics have done to analyze what needs to be done here in terms of policy response and what are the company level implications of what is going to be really now such a major change, which is going to be forceful. It's actually not going to be optional in the future. So Jason, um, if you would like to join me and show us how we can navigate the risks and take advantage of the opportunities. Terrific. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing this, this panel discussion. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is introduce it by way of introducing a broader initiative that Vivid Economics has been involved in and is launching this week called the Inevitable Policy Response. You can find it at the Principle for Responsible, uh, for Responsible Investment website. Um, and essentially, in, in conjunction with, with uh, PRI, um, we took a look at what we think financial markets and investors will be facing in the next few years as, uh, as, a, as policy response begins, begins to accelerate. And the way I want to use that to introduce this panel is to essentially make three key points. The first point about what financial institutions can do is, uh, is simply incorporate what we believe to be a significant regulatory risk of climate action in the next few years, simply incorporate that in their core fiduciary responsibility and investment strategies. I think first and foremost, we should expect no less of our financial institutions to at least understand the real risk and in the context of their day-to-day -day financial investment decisions, take those into account. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I'll make is that if we want to go beyond that and actually get on a 1.5 degree pathway, those same financial institutions will need to start to align their investments with a much more aggressive set of, of actions uh, towards 1.5 degrees, and they will probably need to start to mobilize their engagement with governments to ensure that those same ambitions are reflected in increased policy action at a steady and quick pace. The third point I want to make, um, and I'll make right now, is about what happens if we 
don't get on that trajectory? What do financial institutions need to start to prepare for? And I guess I'll make the argument, and the research we do makes the argument, that if we fail to start to align now, and if financial institutions fail to get governments to act more quickly and more responsibly and begin to align their investments sooner rather than later, we're going to face an even bigger and more drastic set of, of transformations and transitions um, in, in 10 years' time. So I think the key points are for financial investors to incorporate the risk they see now, push for faster action, and be prepared and start to, um, to prepare their investments for what could be an even more extreme, I think, set of risks going forward. So let me take you through that now, step by step. Um, so why did we do this in the first place? So what was the motivation for considering what might be the inevitable policy response? So I think what we've seen and, and what PRI investor engagement has shown is that first and foremost, people are, consider, are, are more and more recognizing that the business as usual scenario for financial and regulatory risk is not just puttering along the way we have for the last decade or two. That in fact, there's increasing um, uh, indications of and expectations of a forceful policy response. But that said, investors have not and do not seem to be yet in partnership with PRI and energy transition, uh, the energy, uh, energy transition advisors, is to look at what that, response might, might, what that policy response might be and how investors should prepare for it. So why do we think such a, such a response is likely? Well, you guys have been here all week, but I think you've also have been around in the last six months. There's significant amounts of change uh, happening. We know that we're seeing greater and greater climate impacts being realized. We see that there is greater and greater movement from society and in the political sphere. And we also see that a number of the key technological options are becoming cheaper and, in fact, economically attractive. So there's a brewing, I guess, a sort of storm of events that I think make us and, and the majority of, of investors believe that, that this kind of response is likely. Is it happening today? Well, probably not. We've seen some of the disappointments in the policy announcements um, from actors today. It's not, it's not going to happen today, or it doesn't seem like it's going to happen today. Will we make the 2020 transition that Barbara spoke to as necessary? Probably not. But, but there is a, a framework through which, and there are a set of policy commitments that lead us to think that a response in the 2023 to 2025 timescale is likely, and then that essentially represents regulatory risk that invest investors need to take seriously. Now, we did a poll last week, uh, two weeks ago, I mean, at PRI in person, and investors seem to, to agree that this is, this is what is brewing. So I think 67% of the investors polled believe that a disorderly policy response is the most likely scenario. In a, in a second um, survey done by BNY Mellon, um, in the, uh, the, those same investors uh, gar gauged it as both uh, a significant risk and also, also gauged it as a risk that they are not currently uh, embedding in their strategic investment decisions. 93% of institutional investors say that climate change is not being priced in by the key global financial markets. That's a significant um, problem, <laughs> we would argue. So how do we go about, and how do investors go about fulfilling the first point I wanted to make, which is simply to incorporate the real risks today into their investment decisions? Well, what you need to do is understand those risks. And so what, the, what our project has done and what you'll see uh, released in the reports that we've been putting out over the last few weeks and over the next few weeks is a breakdown of some of the key areas where these policy risks are likely to manifest themselves. We've broken it down into eight key buckets and examined each of those buckets in each of the key, the key regions. This includes relatively drastic shifts in coal uh, and in, uh, in internal combustion engine uh, vehicles. It also includes the broader shifts we've seen in renewable energy and in energy efficiency. Um, and most critically, I would say, it includes a real treatment of land use. I think in the introductory remarks, we talked about the transformation in the energy sector. But what I think many don't understand is the extent to which and the depth to which land use change will also need to be incorporated. This will involve changes to the way agriculture is produced. It will involve new uh, and different needs for land use that will put constraints on how our core commodities are, are produced and what price they, they are sold at. This will affect numerous supply chains that are at the core of how we live day to day. Now, what did we find and, and where are we getting to? Well, so in this first bit that I've asked investors to, to incorporate, uh, we, see a, we see a shift that is significant. The dark blue line is, is where our policy forecast would currently expect change to happen. And as you can see, it's quite, it's, it's quite a shift. Um, and in that 2022 to 20, 2023 to 2025 period, we see a sharp um, 
shift from the current trajectory, which is the baseline number, and which is often reflected in things like the IEA's new policy scenarios analysis, we see a significant shift happening, one that will have large impacts across the sectors I just described with significant financial implications for investors. However, however, and this leads to my other two points, it will not be enough to get us towards 1.5 degrees. So you can see, while the impacts against what we think investors are currently looking at is large, the overshoot and the possibility of missing 1.5 degrees is perhaps equally large. So that brings me to my, my second point, which is what do investors need to be doing besides preparing for the risk that is already facing them? Well, the first part of it is they need to act now, and they need to start thinking about how they can prepare um, the financial system and the economy for a shift before it becomes too sudden and too drastic. Will we have a very sudden shift in policy this year or next year? Perhaps not. But can investors start to think about allocating their portfolios in a way that prepares for that shift and hence reduce the likelihood of a significant financial impact? Yes, they can. And can they begin to play a more constructive role, let's say, in pushing policymakers to do a better job? We believe they can. So the first, the first part is really about engaging properly with things that would move quicker now rather than waiting for the policy shift to happen. That involves putting on pressure for greater and more transparent and more credible carbon pricing. It involves supporting, in particular, in countries that are, are lagging behind, perhaps like this country, greater support in, in the rollout of lower carbon transport sooner rather than later. And it, it implies much stronger action in terms of improving the effectiveness and efficiency of our, our agricultural land use systems and of our, of our energy use in general. So that's the second thing that I think investors can do to start to open up the opportunities and leverage their portfolios to move, to move forward. However, there is a third thing which we have to be realistic about. Assuming we, we miss some of those opportunities and assuming we do it do, assuming that the inevitable policy response does occur but is not sufficient to get us to 1.5 degrees, I think the financial sector and, and the financial institutions need to recognize that there is an even bigger risk, a sort of tail risk, if you will, that is brewing. And if we are on, on the wrong track for too long, the shift will be even more, more sudden. As you can see, the overshoot and the ability to, to catch up with that overshoot gets harder and harder every year we wait. And at some point, if this risk starts to build, financial institutions need to be ready for a much more drastic shift, almost a wartime footing shift, one in which we'll have to see massive scale up of technologies in a disorderly and, and non-efficient way, and in which we'll have much, much stronger government uh, action and potentially even control over major sectors of the economy. I think investors who want to prepare for what will be um, the action need to consider this as well and need to start thinking about how their portfolios are, are ready for and perhaps um, helping lay the groundwork for uh, an even more drastic shift. So I'll leave you with those three points uh, as a, a kicker to the uh, to the discussion now from our, our eminent panel. And uh, I hand off, I guess, back to our, our host. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and Jason, you're so right to remind us that this is not just about energy. And I think that realization is penetrating people's consciousness in the last year or two in a way it has not done before. The other thing that's happening, of course, is that we are all now thinking about 1.5 degrees. And two years ago, we weren't. We were all on the two degree. And even those graphs that you were showing, much of that analysis from people like the IEA was around two degrees. So, you know, we know that challenge is greater. And so the panel is going to uh, start to uh, help us thread our way through uh, what needs to be done uh, to harness the investment opportunities for this net zero future, uh, which is coming much faster than a year or two ago we thought was likely. I'd like to introduce Emily Shazan. Emily is the Sustainable Finance Editor at Bloomberg News, and she writes about trends in sustainable and impact investing, as well as corporate responsibility and governance, and she's going to moderate that panel discussion. Emily, welcome. You don't need to turn it on. Just build it. Build it. Oh, did you? That should work now. Okay, and I'd like to invite the panelists just to join me up on stage. Thank you. Wherever you like. 
open seating. So I write about um, sustainable finance at Bloomberg News, and it's always been interesting because a few years ago when I started covering the space, I had to write most of the stories myself, and now there's stories everywhere. So this has really changed a lot in just a few years. And um, I don't know how many of you caught the um, Prime Minister Barbados at the Global Climate Action Summit, and she was saying 1.5 degrees is life or death for them. Two degrees has off the table. There's no way. We've all been talking about two degrees for years, trying to get to Paris. But for them, we need to go for 1.5. So companies have been scaling up a little bit. And the ones that are really progressive have been getting there to two degrees. There's really aggressive investors have been getting to two degrees. Um, but we have to think about what it means to be a 1.5 degree company, what it means to finance a 1.5 degree world. And um, our panel is going to help you do that today. So um, I'd like to introduce Kevin Smith from Goldman Sachs, Stephen Nichols from Bank of America, Suze McCormick from um, Mofo. Mofo. Thank you. The short way to say it, Morrison Forster, <laughs> and um, Jason Channel from Citigroup. So we're going to have a great panel. But I thought I posed to the whole panel as you guys sort of think about this question yourself. You know, what does it mean in your business right now to be a 1.5 degree? business, 1.5 degree financier. Um, Kevin, I'll start with you. Can you hear me okay? This is on. Okay. Um, so first, thanks all for having me. I'm, I'm with our sustainable finance group that works across all of our uh, divisions in terms of um, looking at commercial opportunities that have both an environmental or inclusive growth themes. Um, I think the question is when we were talking a little earlier about the difference between two degree and one and a half beyond the obvious point of, of half a degree difference in terms of uh, the, the coolness factor uh, that we need to address is really a, a question of velocity, velocity and our business is moving at the speed and pace that we need to see to get there. Um, and in some cases they are, in some cases um, there's still more work to be done. I think you know, for the financial community, we've tried to organize ourselves so that you know, we are pursuing great opportunities that have commercial relevance. Again, this isn't philanthropy. This is this needs to be driven by revenue opportunities, uh, where there's great commercial opportunity, but also a great um, you know transition uh, to a, a lower carbon world. And hence, how we've organized ourselves in different sectors and different um, places where we've put a focus on sectors like clean energy and and sustainable transport and other areas like that. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised to see some of our clients that are starting to do that as well and I think and I think we'll get into the the different products a little bit more in this in this panel but it's been nice to see some of the companies starting to mainstream as part of their long-term strategic um, objectives and strategic goals to have a tar have targets in place and have um, you know investment plans and capital X plans that that match those those sorts of things so we can get into more detail but um, you know th thanks for having me thanks Stephen. Yeah. So for me, it's quite a complicated question. I, I work for Bank of America. We're a major lending institution. The goal that you saw for our environmental business initiative is actually outdated. Uh, it was $125 billion of climate-friendly financing, and we're actually going to meet that this year. And we've announced a new target of $300 billion for the next decade. So we also are we have a goal to be carbon neutral by next year and to source all of our energy from renewables by next year as well. So from a fundamental banking operations perspective, we then would be a 1.5 or 2 degree business. We also have a lending portfolio. We have an asset management business. And it's more complex to get those parts of the business in line with a 1.5 degree scenario. We're obviously working on that. We're a supporter of TCFD. Our CFO is on the board of SASB, so there's, there remains work to be done there. I work in the capital markets function of the business, so I am in dialogue every day with investors who are looking to get their own portfolios aligned with those scenarios, as well as companies who need to raise capital from those investors in order to get their own business aligned. And as I see it, I think disclosure is probably one of the biggest issues that we have that the quality and comparability of data from one company to the next is not very high in the sustainability world. It's quite high from a financial perspective, but there's a lot of work to be done from a sustainability perspective. That's a really interesting challenge to the group that we need um, better data quickly so that you can make these uh, 
these changes. Suze. Hi, I'm, I'm Suze McCormick. I'm a, a partner at MoFo, um, and I've been focused on the space since about 2001. And, and from a legal perspective, there are really kind of two things, two things going on. Um, first is really sort of a, a, the recognition across sort of the mainstream that this is happening and we have to build in climate risk. Um, but, you know, with due respect for Bank of America, they're really, you know, in, in the U.S., 100 companies that have about 95 percent of the emissions. So we need to be concentrating on the sectors, on you know, energy generation, on transport, on ag, on the big sectors that are really the big emitters. And the others need to be focused on sort of managing the risk. What has been interesting over the last kind of six to 12 months for me is the risk is coming in new areas. Uh, we were recently engaged by a large tech company um, because its technology is being used by the oil majors. And the question was, you know, not, not a demand from investors, although the LPs are very active, but a demand from employees that, in fact, by providing the technology, the cloud-based technology that the oil majors are using, that company is actually furthering, um, furthering climate, and they are, you know, on the verge of having a, a major employee walkout. And so one one of the exciting things that is happening is really coming up with creative solutions. You have it on one, on one end, you have divestment. On the other end, can you think creatively about how to restructure those license agreements when you're licensing the technology to mitigate the impact of climate? So that's, that's sort of on the climate risk scenario. On the investor and company side, we're also seeing a lot of a lot more movement. So again, I think we'll talk a little bit about green bonds. To me, those are just you know maybe a cherry on the icing on the cake, and we need the whole cake. And there's a lot of discussion about use of philanthropic capital, use of social enterprises. That is such a tiny fraction of the capital markets. It really needs to be integrated in all of the capital markets. And so some of the most exciting creative work we're doing is working with fund structures, not accepting sort of the, the you know the age old you know two and twenty with the same kind of cap you know same kind of, uh, of compensation structure, but really playing with the structures so that when LPs are investing in a fund, they can ensure that in fact that fund is going to be making investments that mitigate impact, and then the debt and equity instruments, which we'll talk about, and then the underlying portfolio companies, not not you know sort of B corps or anything that is a a license or tag, although I agree on the reporting side, but really shifting of fiduciary duties at the board level so that people can really embed a focus on climate mitigation in their, in their operations. Great. And Jason, tell us what 1.5 degrees means to you at City. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the point that I want to make is, is, and it sounds kind of obvious, but it is worth saying, right, is, is just how unbelievably difficult it is to stay within one and a half. And, and I do worry sometimes when I hear people talk about one and a half that they haven't quite twigged just how difficult that is, right? And, and it isn't, you know, it, it's not that we shouldn't be focusing on what companies are doing, etc. but what we also need to, to be hugely, hugely cognizant of is, is just the, the, the legacy inertia in the system as well, right? And it's not just about getting companies to put targets in place and signal that they're going for net zero by 2030 or 2038 or 2050 or whatever it may be, right? It's, it's things, um, you know, it, it's, we, we've got to incentivize the positive, but we've also got to tax the negative, right? We've got to get legacy fleets um, out of aviation, shipping, cars, whatever it may be, um, power stations, you know, coal-fired power stations have a 40-year life, right? It, it's, you know, so it, so it isn't, we, we have to be slightly careful about not just thinking, right, we've got to put pressure on companies, right? I mean, I, I, I've moved on from my role of just talking to investors, and I now spend uh, at least as much of my time talking to corporates and governments around the world, and, and the will is there, and how do we do it, and what is a one and a half degree company look like it's putting the targets in place and it's and it's having a will and it's being public about it right and one of the one of the challenges that is out there and again I'm sure we'll come on to it you've mentioned green bonds and and, and, and things like that is to do this properly you need to put long-term targets in place and one of the challenges is is the short-termism of markets at the moment particularly equity markets which are out there 
Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, we're seeing, we still see corporates being penalized for doing what is viewed by a lot of people as, as a cost, rather than looking at the opportunity, as we were just hearing there as well. So it's about putting longer-term targets out there, moving towards a shareholder base which buys into those targets and will stick with you, which arguably gives you a lower cost of capital, which then arguably allows you to re-tilt the company into areas which, let's be honest, may be lower return than some of the worst things we could stay invested in, right? So it's so we need to do that. We need to tax out um, the, the, the other stuff as well. Um, but we shouldn't be under any illusions about how difficult that is. Yeah, it's a big rewiring of incentives. And um, it's interesting that you, you say that because uh, Citi was the only big U.S. bank to sign the principles of responsible banking just the other day. And at the end of that signing ceremony, Eric Usher, who's been leading that for that group, he said, you know, banks really need to scale up the green and scale down the brown. Um, and that creates a huge tension in banks, so I, I feel like we should get right to that question. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Kevin. How do you uh, have those conversations around green versus brown? Sure, um, and, and this kind of gets back to my uh, question, or my, my comments earlier about transition. And so I, I agree there are certain products that we should continue to incentivize and continue to have clients uh, come to the market. Green bonds is a good example of it. Um, but to, to kind of the comments made before, you know, it is a relatively small part of the capital markets. And so what we try to focus on is how can we work with our incumbent clients that are maybe in some of those more fossil intensive or carbon intensive industries and get, to them, get them to a place of transition. So for example, um, which I, I think was a great example of the mainstreaming of this, um, we had the pleasure of working with Anel, which is one of the lar Italy's largest um, power um, company over the last couple of weeks with some of, some of my colleagues here on, on the panel, I'm sure were involved in that as well. And they did their inaugural SDG linked bond, which was a, um, a, a mainstream financing. Uh, it had a coupon readjustment based on them meeting a predetermined um, renewable energy capacity target, uh, which gives some kind of skin in the game for them. Um, but importantly, it was not a use of proceeds dri driven bond. It was uh, general corporate, which I think we hear from a lot of companies in terms of giving them flexibility. But in order to do that, in order to get um, the investor appetite for those sorts of things, we did an extensive discussion and roadshows with the investor community to educate them on the business model and on the strategy of the company. And so the, the company has Nine, something like 95% of their capex is going towards green or just you know smart grid solutions, very much ingrained in their you know corporate level uh, approach and showing that they have long-term targets that they are um, progressing towards those and they want to get the, the, the benefit from the investor community for doing those sorts of things. So I think that's an illustration of how we can work with clients to kind of you know, further those types of encourage those types of, uh, and a price very well, it was very well received by the market. So I think encouraging clients to try to push in that direction so that, you know, there is more kind of shift from green and not just in a specific green bond uh, portfolio. Yeah, that's interesting what you're saying. I just have a follow up on that because sure. um, the sustainability linked loan is a really, yeah. that's a brand new type of asset. And um, it seems like it could potentially make uh, green finance available to many more companies who say maybe I don't have enough projects for a green right. bond. Yeah, so I mean, I think it, it, I think it works for a company that has a you know strategy for them for the long term in terms of progressing it. You're right; they may not have a specific dollar amount of assets every year that they would fund, although they could do that through a green bond um, type of strata, um, issuance. But if they have a clear direction, you know, they have targets and they want to kind of align themselves with it and put some of the you know upside to the investor. Uh, in terms of that kind of structure that could work. It's not for everyone, but I think it demonstrates that um, there is appetite for kind of coming to market for companies that are making that effort. Um, Stephen, how are you guys having the green-brown conversation? So we do try to engage with our clients who are in sectors that we might consider brown. I think that you know, for me, that's been a better approach for our bank. We. There are multiple innovations within the financial markets that I think can start to bring some of those companies along with the green market. So I'm a member of the executive committee for the green bond principles. Uh, we kind of set the rules for what green bonds are. There's a lot of discussion in that body about something called transition bonds, which would be for industries that maybe aren't quite able to get to 
zero carbon today, but have important contributions to make to limit us to a 1.5 degree scenario, I think it's very valuable for investors who are focused on ESG risks and are, who are focused on sustainability to get the opportunity to engage with those companies as opposed to just kind of writing them off or taking a divestment approach. I'll, I'll give you an example from a, a recent green bond transaction that I was working on. It was the first industrial company in the U.S. that issued a green bond. And their chief sustainability officer was on, on the calls doing marketing similar to what we did on the NL transaction. And multiple investors in that scenario asked their treasurer and their chief sustainability officer, what is the cost of these sustainability initiatives that you're pursuing? And I could almost you know, see the chief sustainability officer's eyes you know, light up, right? He's, he's excited about that question because everything they're doing actually has a business case, right? And there's a misperception, not just in the business community, but also in the investment community, that there's a cost of going green. And I think that's a, a real important part of these types of financial innovations that can help shift more capital towards companies that are doing so. Um, I have sort of a side note for that question for Suze. Um, sort of how does this green versus brown conversation um, get involved in conversations around fiduciary duty? I'll answer that if I can go back for a second. Sure. <laughs> um, I just want to go back to green bonds. I think one of the biggest issues that people people like me and a lot of other people in the sector see in green bonds is if it, if you're just focused on the use of proceeds, let's just say you're focused on you know green infrastructure, renewable energy, fabulous. But the whole process, the development, the construction process itself is kind of put to the side. And there is, you know, I, I think a real need to, to really look to the net impact. How are you building? What kind of, are you using, you know, carbon sequestering cement? Are you really advancing? Um, and the other thing I wanted to say on the green versus brown for the banks is I think all of the banks have to get over to the model. We're going to finance over here. We're going to do some good on the side philanthropically. The, the foundation model is just dead. It was never designed to be used for big issues like climate. If you, I can take you back, you know, 200 years to when, you know, the, the ideas around a foundation were formed. We need public charities. If, if we're going to have some philanthropic on the side, one of the most I think exciting ideas is to really use that as catalytic capital, either through stack deck funds or there are groups like Prime, which are putting in the philanthropic capital to like try the science experiment so it can be mainstream funded, or Rockefeller with their zero gap program. They're they're you know testing a financial experiment so that these guys can invest later. That's what it should be used for, and you avoid you know you're doing all this you know good stuff on the side related to carbon, this, uh, carbon, this sort of the, the Jamie Diamond issue, but you're financing coal. The same time. Those are sort of structural changes. The fiduciary duties, one of, one, one of the shifts that I think has to happen, if we're, I, I agree that if we're going to get to 1.5, it's going to have to happen really quickly. I don't believe the corporate form is broken. I'm going to give you in 30 seconds a, a whole course that I teach at Berkeley Law School. Um, so um, I do believe to move quickly, we need to shift fiduciary duties for boards and, and management of companies to sort of a dual, a shareholder agreed duty, which can include climate, in addition to uh, shareholder value, not to the exclusion of in addition to shareholder value. Um, it's called B Corp. It's not a B Corp. This is a, a shift, and there are some of these forms, actually many of these forms operating. What it does is it combats the short-termism. So if you are a company, if you invest in a company and you want the company, a brown company, I agree, we actually can probably get a lot more traction investing in the brown companies and getting them to move forward because transportation, ag, you know, energy, that's where the emissions are. We've got to focus there. I was interested that the gentleman before, coal, 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 we can't, you know, even even in the U.S., that, that's where we need to be going and focusing. If you give a coal company, you shift the fiduciary duties, you give them climate as a fiduciary duty, they are insulated from shareholder liability when they make long-term capital outlays and infrastructure plays. So we have a solution. We just need it adopted, and we need people to, we need financers, we need the LPs to say, yes, this is, in fact, what we're going to start requiring where we're making these investments. Did I hit fiduciary duty? Thank you. Okay. I'm, 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 thank you for the, for, the, for the plug that we signed. Um, it's, it's, it's something that, that we do take very, very seriously. And, and 
It, it's difficult, right? I, I have a different view on things for different sectors. Now, I, there are certain sectors out there where, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about coal and renewables, right? You know, I, I ran a, a renewables energy, I built and ran the renewables business at Goldman actually for, for, for many years back in 2005. And, it, and it's, um, you know, around the world, that is now cheaper than fossil fuels. You know, that, that horse has bolted, that's done, right? The, the issue uh, is, the fact that in upfront investment terms, things like coal are still cheaper, right? So that's where financial markets come in, and it's via innovative financial instruments, you know, which can help to spread the, the upfront cost, if you like, over the, the life in a sort of an LCOE sense of the economics of building something, right? So, so that's where the financial community can, can play an active role. Now, I think there's a difference, again, between sectors where we have an alternative where we don't have to argue about the economics whereas we've got others where the economics don't yet work and therefore we need incentives, we need regulatory pressure, uh, et cetera, to help push that through. And, and I think it also therefore means you have a different approach in terms of divestment or engagement or whatever, because whatever you think about oil, right, and, and you know, shameless plug number two is a, a thing there on uh, energy Darwinism three, a big report we've just put out taking about a year. It, it just shows you how incredibly difficult it is to take oil out of the system. And, and, and this comes back to my point about one and a half degrees. In, in there, we basically built an integrated global energy and emissions model. We've moved to 100. It's not about forecasts. It's about sensitivities, right? If you move to 100% electric vehicles in developed markets, yeah, you don't change oil demand at all, right? Because we just move legacy fleets over to emerging markets and things like that. So it's about, it's about understanding yeah, and, and, and engaging with corporates. Um, and, and, and explaining the backdrop to it, but looking at it and saying, look, even if we all wanted to stop using oil tomorrow, it's just not possible, right? And, and we need to consider, you know, that even if it was, I mean, you would have an entire breakdown of social order within days, right, if, if you could somehow switch it off, right? It, it's, so, so that's a different conversation, right? What we have to do is, is engage with our clients, and so there are some very progressive companies out there in the sector who are really trying to do that. You know, this is fundamental, these are existential questions for them, right? So engage with them and, and work with them through that transition to work out how they can play you know, a positive role in that transition rather than sort of just be the rabbit in the headlights and be the bad person in, in, in the room. And, and there are very, very different approaches from, uh, from, from different corporates. But I think, you know, I'm sure it'll come up later, but, but cost of capital is another way that, that, you know, markets can do that and we can play our part in that. You know, you've talked about innovative financing uh, things. You know, we, we were on that one as well with that kicker on the bond. It's a, it's a very interesting scenario. We're also seeing it in equity markets as well. We think uh, in the oil sector there's a 2% cost of capital differential, funnily enough, the, the wrong way around between US listed oil majors and European oil majors. So one of the interesting things about like the sustainable bond is not just that you can potentially get a differential cost of finance on the, on the debt side, it can actually signal a lot for the equity side and drive a different cost of capital there, right? And, and you could even argue that it potentially gives some additionality to investors as well, right? Because there's a, it's, driving, it's driving change within a business. And one of the things that investors, and I'm sure we talk about impact as well, complain about is that it's very, very difficult to demonstrate impact using secondary market listed instruments, right? Because somebody sells it, you buy it. It's just different capital, but it's not new capital. So, uh, so I think banks can play a very, very important part. Um, and that's not just by saying, we're not gonna do that, right? It's by engaging with longstanding clients and working through that transition with them. Right. Yeah, it's interesting um, what you're saying and how you can sort of sense that the rules of the game are shifting a little bit, right? Like you, I've heard a lot about that, sort of that car example you just gave about saying, you know, if we send those fleets of cars to developed countries, but may, what if they're like China and China doesn't want our trash anymore? Maybe they won't take our cars anymore. <laughs> so um, I feel like people are changing their incentives and um, what they're doing. Um, so when you look at this whole landscape, I think if you look at Bloomberg's data for clean energy, we see 354 billion was financed in 2018. That's up from 60 billion in 2004, so that's a, a big increase. But um, we still need five or six times that clean energy alone to get to the IPCC targets for two degrees, let alone like 1.5 degrees. Um, and it doesn't include agriculture, energy efficiency, 
transport, all those other topics. So where I want to ask the panel just where are you guys seeing all these different opportunities and the best place to put capital right now from a returns perspective and from a climate perspective. But I also want to tell the audience that we're going to start taking your questions. And I think um, they'll put up something on the screen that shows you how to log in to ask a question on the app. So if you have any questions, um, please get those ready and I'll take them a little bit later. Um, but yes, for the audience, maybe you guys could spark some questions with the answer to these questions on um, where you're seeing uh, the best opportunities. Kevin? Yeah, sure. So I'll start and others can fill in. I mean, look, re renewables does play a, a big role in terms of um, the, the types of investment or financing opportunities that we're seeing. Um, particularly, um, we've seen some good opportunities in the U.S. Uh, CNI uh, distributed space. We launched a fund. Uh, which we announced recently about a $2 billion fund that's focused exclusively on U.S. Uh, CNI solar. Um, and so I've seen a lot of investor appetite um, in terms of th those types of um, assets as well as um, the return returns on that. Um, you know, in, in other markets, we're seeing renewables being good opportunities. We've, we've got a big investment in India in, in terms of renewables as well as Japan. Um, some of that plays into the policy incentives as well. Uh, we also did a big investment in um, in the battery storage space as well recently through a company called Northvolt, um, which is looking to scale um, kind of uh, battery solutions to apply into the electric vehicle um, space. So those are a few examples of of the types of sectors that that we've seen uh, that continue to have uh, you know investment appetite from from our clients and from our our, um, our funds that we manage. Yeah, I think in addition to renewables, obviously, I would highlight what I'll call enabling technologies. So manufacturers of wind turbines, manufacturers of solar panels, we need more capacity there in order to scale up to meet the massive challenge that we have to get to 1.5 degrees or to limit to 1.5 degrees. I'll also, I'll just point out again, that thing came up earlier in the presentation, the sectors that don't get as much attention like agriculture and preventing deforestation uh, supporting companies that are using sustainable practices or are sourcing their raw materials from sustainable suppliers, I think is extremely important. Um, I mean, we, you know, we all talk about renewables and, and stuff like that. I, th I think the biggest problem, right, is, is is just the lack of listed vehicles, right? There's, there's, you know, there's there's 90 trillion, north of 90 trillion dollars of, of AUM for the signatories of the PRI. There's 30 trillion dollars of, of ESG screened assets out there. There's three trillion dollars of, of ESG funds out there. It's not that the money's not there, right? It's the it's the vehicles to deploy it. That's that's the issue. And and much as I think everybody would like to invest in renewable energy, right? We've just got you know a very very crowded space, right? So, um, and the problem. Uh, if we're talking about investing directly, is that you know we also need to think about this from an impact perspective, right? If you if you go up to Scandinavia and build a I don't know a wind farm up there, does it make a difference? Well, yeah, it makes a difference. But does it make a difference between you know in the same way that building a wind farm in India or it does? You, you, no, it doesn't, right? There's, there's one has has way more, if you like, uh, sort of offsetting impact than um, than the other. Um, the issue is that the majority of places where we need to see the changes, like you say, with, you know, whether it's legacy fleets of, of internal combustion engines going over to emerging markets or whatever, by definition, you know, a lot of this stuff is infrastructure based, um, which means that you're typically going to lever it at 60 to 70 percent. And the problem with most of these markets, or a lot of these markets, is that they're sub investment grade, right? So you have you have trillions of dollars of capital that wants to chase projects, but investment grade projects. So. One of the things that we need to do is is actually look at innovative structures, right? So, so I am trying to answer your question, but in a slightly different way, right? So, instead of building this stuff with DFI development capital, right, what we need to be doing is using the right forms of capital to provide a risk mitigation tool, some sort of collar mechanism, which ever elevates the creditworthiness of the underlying projects and allows the private capital in, whether it's equity or debt. So, it's the innovative structures, and then I think that will drive collective funds, uh, which will take a single asset or single technology or single sovereign risk out of it as well. So those are, I think, without giving any specifics, those are the things that I'm most excited about and interested at the moment, is those innovative structures which get the capital to flow because of uh, um, differing uh, uh, methods of, of, of elevating risk and, and credit worthiness. 
And he had no idea that that's where I was going to go last year. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I mean, you know, where, where are the highest returns and the lowest risk and the most mature markets, obviously. So how do you, but that's, that's not where we need to deploy capital quickly. And so I was just going to go back to what I said at the beginning. Some of the things that are innovative, which are working, are like prime capital. If you take philanthropic capital or Rockefeller that, that tests the science experiment and sees if it works, and then when it grows up and works, you can take, you know, you can then make, you know, r return, you know, investment grade return based, you know, investments and, and deploy capital up there. I think that's, that's one really good model. Another model that we have now, when I say we've tried it, it means it's been done more than once, and now it has been done at scale with a couple billion dollar fund where you actually take a nonprofit and embed it in the GP. Um, I can explain to you how that works, but that ensures that unlike the greenwashing, which I think, I'll, I'm sorry, a lot of the green bonds and a lot of the, the investment in this area does, it's doing some good. It's, it's sort of, you know, marginally accretive, but it's not doing the kind of good that we need. That can tip the scale. Um, and then there are what I call stack deck or blended funds where you actually can de-risk a market, de-risk a set of investments because, again, you co-mingle philanthropic capital with mainstream capital and you prove out a model. And especially, I'm working on one right now, Southeast Asia, in certain areas, that's really the only way to de-risk so that later on investors can come in. So the good news is there is a lot of work that has been done. And I, I love the, the SDG-linked bonds, really thinking granularly about what you measure, how you measure, um, and then how you benchmark to make sure that not only is it, you know, net impact, not only is it really positive impact, but for the capital, one of the things that is, I'll just say, incredibly frustrating to those of us who've been around is it's solar, it's Africa, it's good. No, it's not. You know, what kind of solar? Is it good or bad? What happens to the underlying land? How is that solar being constructed? All of those questions when you're deploying capital are just so critical, which goes back to the, to the report, the measurement and reporting part. Yeah, it's interesting what you're talking about in de-risking because we all sort of know startups are risky, right? And yeah. these are all sort of startup things. So how do you um, de-risk this so investors feel comfortable? Maybe I'll give Kevin a break and start with Stephen and then go back to Kevin. I mean, in the renewable space, the power purchase agreement has been doing that for decades now, right? It's uh, long-term stable cash flows that are financeable. I think when you get you know about PG&E, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the um, by and large, that's been that's been a uh, a successful model. Obviously, not you know there's a bankruptcy probability at any credit rating, right? So, um, but it has enabled a tremendous amount of capital to flow to those to those types of assets. For me. Um, I think when you get into the emerging markets and you're trying to develop credit enhancement structures, you know, that almost has to come from a concessionary form of capital that's either a you know, sovereign, a, an SSA issuer, a development institution, um, or, or like you're talking about, a blended finance and charitable structure. Uh, but that, I personally worry that that's going to be difficult to scale. Since you hopped in there, why, why, did you, why did that make you think about PG&E? Uh, well, I, I just, yeah. I think everything, if you measure risk based on our current, all the current economic models, you're probably getting it wrong. I mean, so I, th I think the risk is going to change, and it's going to change very, very quickly in assessing the risk. So um, the question is how you do sort of more creative structures that de-risk. The blended finance models that I've used in the past I don't think have been able to be used effectively at scale. And so that's sort of why moving to more of a stack deck, which I, I don't have time to explain, um, but really working backwards and, it, you know, sort of with the SDGs, but where where is the need the greatest? How do we fill it? And then how do we change you know, I'll, I, I love Goldman and I love Kevin, so I'll pick on Kevin. You know, how do you change the structure of Goldman so that they can do that? So, they, you know, they don't have a foundation on the side, but maybe they have a public charity on the side. Maybe they have an impact sidecar, so they've got their $2 billion renewable energy fund, and on the side they take higher risk, um, you know, quasi-philanthropic capital where they're going to people and saying, in fact, you are going to get less of a return. And what I'm finding in the markets, and I work with a lot of family office and, and philanthropic donors, is that there is a multiplier effect. They are more interested in investing if they can give 
and invest at the same time and, and can multiply. So we're seeing people put together sort of impact sidecars on the fund that can then test this out more in the mainstream markets to run alongside. So that's the structural change I would like to see at the banks themselves in terms of how they how they deploy capital. Because we just we we have time and we do, we just don't have time for it to grow up sort of naturally. And let's try another SDG linked bond. There, it's a really good. I, I love the model, but we need more catalysts for change. Yeah, and well, you you are at Goldman. You guys are changing how you do sustainable finance. Um, but tell me, like, is your goal to sort of de-risk these to make these investments more scalable? Look, part of our mission is to look at more innovative types of structures that we can either work with our clients or or directly. I mean, the the blended finance model, I think, is a is a good good idea um, and and one that we should explore in more detail. I, I do think. You know, oftentimes when we have discussions, and we've had them in the past with, with certain investors, in some ways, um, and maybe it's a, a large family or a family office, very much it's viewed as kind of left pocket, right pocket in some ways. So I think there's also an education process for you know big big family offices or others that that may have that desire to to provide some more catalyst within their philanthropy because a lot of times they have you know a separate team that does philanthropy from the separate team that does their investments and the two don't talk and and so forth and so you know there's an education process both on the banking side as well as certainly on the client side to try to do more in interesting and innovative things. There's, there's, there's also some really st simple stuff out there, there as well, and I, and I think you know, yeah, I spend my life doing complicated stuff as well, right? But but one of the, you know, an example to give you is, is you know, I I have the same conversation multiple times around the world, right? I'm trying to divest coal, I'm trying to divest oil, right? I want to redeploy the capital, as I said earlier, right? There isn't the secondary listed things. What choices have I got? I've got to invest direct, right? And, this, and the conversation usually goes something along the lines of, I can't do that because if I build a solar farm in Southeast Asia, I've got single technology risk, single sovereign risk, you know, and single project risk, and I'm, and I'm totally maxed out on my risk. And there's no way I'll get that past my investment committee, right? And, and you know, if I have that conversation 10 times, Right? It's very frustrating when you go, right, well, why can't you all get together and build 10 of them and have 10% of it? You know, it's basic portfolio theory, right? So, so we, we mustn't overlook stuff like that, right, in, in trying to be clever about stuff. So there's some pretty basic stuff in terms of pooled funds. And then, of course, the more we do of this, um, you know, the more we set precedents, the more uh, examples we have of actually what risk premium should be, um, you know, and, and on, the, on the bad side, if you like, we also uh, get more of a sense of what the risk premium should be there in terms of risk of standard assets or carbon prices or whatever. And then we start to get a much better picture of our cost of capital differential between these things, what the returns should be, and, and, and we do actually lower risk or we price risk more, more successfully yeah. as well. So, so not just the, the, the difficult stuff, there's some basic stuff out there is that can make a real difference by getting this trillions of private capital to actually flow through and make stuff happen quickly. I think to that point, right, we just saw that 93% of investors don't think climate risk is appropriately priced in financial markets, which is a, kind of a staggering number, honestly. So um, to me, we have to get more disclosure because the U.S. investment grade and equity capital markets are an incredibly efficient machine at raising capital, and we need those capital raising machines to be directing capital towards the kind of projects that can keep us on a 1.5 degree scenario. What I, what I would say about that, though, is that, is that if we think markets are efficient, that would imply a disproportionate influence of the 7% which makes me suggest that 93% is perhaps a little uh, optimistic on the basis that a lot of people that don't believe it isn't priced aren't pricing it themselves. So, you know, it starts at home. Yeah. Uh, just to add to one point that you mentioned is I do think there is a role of either philanthropy or the donor community to support the technical assistance side of it, it's particularly in emerging markets, because a lot of deals that we look at just don't get developed to the place where it's right for an institution like ours to take a look at. And I know there's a whole community and ecosystem that's doing that, but I do think there is a role for that to, to get things to kind of capital market level um, readiness in, in terms of um, deploying of, uh, at scale. Well, when we look at this whole space and sort of the low carbon investment future and banking future, um, it seems like, you know, we've done a lot on moving away from oil and coal and renewables. It's not done yet, but, you know, you've done a lot. So outside of those, um, where are some of the best opportunities right now? 
maybe everyone can say one relatively just quickly. Kind of like the, our, our future vision of where. Well, more, outside more of go. outside of renewables. Yeah. So look, I, there probably hasn't been as much done in in the space, but I'd love for there to be more focus on forestry and afforestation and other kind of sequestration related investments that we haven't um, seen to come to scale as much as as other sectors. Yeah. In, in a potential candidate for blended finance, I think uh, investing in economic empowerment for women around the world has a massive potential to impact climate change. Oh, you're a cow town. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, I was going to say, I, I'll just say sequestration so I don't mirror Kevin. I think sequestration and also some of the technology that's coming out to take carbon out of the atmosphere without the geoengineering has real potential. I mean, I think that that's the elephant in the room is, 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 is how we move to net negative, right? We, we haven't even thought about that yet. So, so if we need to do that beyond 2050 or beyond 2030, we really need to start thinking about, about that now. But, um, but a, a big one for me, and I mean, from a broader sustainability perspective is, is water. I mean, we did one of these on City GPS on, uh, uh, on, on the SDGs, right? And the one that leaps out there is water, actually. Um, you could fix that for two and a half billion people around the world for about $80 billion a year, which is, which is nothing. And you think about the impact of that on cities, on health, et cetera, et cetera. So there's other things that, you know, obviously do have an impact on this as well, where money could be very, very uh, effectively deployed, which could then essentially free up uh, other capital from uh, being spent on other things, and, and we could put it, put it to effect on, on climate. Okay. Um, I have another short question for you guys um, while I go over and I have to fetch the, uh, the question iPad. Um, but I guess my question for all of you is um, if you sort of were a magician and could get rid of one, oh, thank you, Suze, <laughs> do it for me. Um, if you were a magician and could get rid of one um, barrier to this kind of investment, what would you pick? Um, Stephen, you're nodding, so you get to go first. <laughs> um, so I would say to do away with this historical legacy impression that being environmentally friendly or being green is charitable and a bad business case. And I would do that both in the investment community and the corporate community in the U.S. And I, I, on a similar vein, we, we have grown up with this model that you make money and you give money away on the side. You have your corporate, you make your money, you have your foundation. And I think that is one of, and you know, what, exactly what Kevin said, I mean, the family offices we both work with, you've got your grant making over here and your investment and the two are totally different. Um, the, the, it, that, that has to be broken. And, and I think the companies and investors have to be held accountable for integrating this within the mainstream or we're, we're just, you know, in, in the core of their business, not the good stuff they do on the side or we're never going to get there. And it's possible to do it, and it's legal to do it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo that. It's a, you know, see it as an opportunity, not a cost. And those aren't just words. It's true if you do it right. But the, but the, the big one for me, uh, it's getting uh, uh, emerging market credit up to investment grade. That that would that would mobilise so much capital. Uh, it would have an extraordinary impact. Okay. So our one question from the audience is, how do we get rid of short termism? in all of these decisions and what we can, maybe we can do sort of that magic uh, question again. Hey, How do you do it? Let's start with Sue. <laughs> well, there are two. There is, I mean, for those of you who haven't heard of it, long-term stock exchange, you know, but I, I really think it's shifting the fiduciary duties uh, within the corporate structure in a very in a meaningful and responsible way. And, and from our, our bankers here. Yeah, I would say similar, but having kind of the investor Having the ultimate end investors be the long-term stewards, so the asset owners, um, would be helpful in terms of encouraging companies to take a longer-term perspective um, because of the system that's set up. It, you know, it, it is challenging at times, but if you can ultimately have kind of the, the large um, asset owner population kind of giving management those types of flexibility to set longer-term strategies, I think would be an important thing. And comp. And comp. Yeah, it's an incentive problem, right? Uh, investors are judged on their yearly returns versus index, right? And we all need to be willing to accept the term is tracking error, right? And think about long-term returns versus how did I do versus the index last year? Yeah, it's true. People call it the benchmark trap in the ESG space. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, hero CEOs is something Paul Polman's working on now. He's having visionary CEOs that aren't scared to, to, to come out and do that. Um, and then what we also need is we need institutional investors to put their money where their mouth is, right? Because they all say they want this, right? But then, you know, it comes back to the 93 and the 7 again, right? You get a lot of companies that come out of this and announce a long-term strategy, and there's still too many investors out there that look at that and see the cost, not the opportunity. They vote with their feet. Um, if they're serious about this, and, and it's about successful communication by those CEOs as well, but they need to communicate that, and they need to develop the investor base that will then travel with them over the long term uh, and, and will not be interested in short-term effects. And that then gives, you know, it's a, it's a, a sort of a, a, a virtuous circle, a symbiotic relationship that then gives them a cheaper cost of capital uh, it gives the chief executive more space to be more bold to keep pushing those targets etc and, 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 and it's a it's a long-term capital base with a low cost of capital that allows long-term visions to be put in place rather than jumping through short-term quarterly hoops great well thank you for a great panel everybody um, really enjoyed it and we all have a lot of work to do thank you Thank you, Emily, and thanks to the panel. A um, lot of food for thought there about the kind of instruments, um, but one of the messages that is coming across quite strongly is that most of them already exist. We just need to tweak the framework, the incentives, and maybe uh, governments are going to get there through the inevitable policy response as they uh, come up to the uh, implications for reaching 1.5 degrees of the Paris process. And one of the things that tends to be underestimated is the ratchet mechanism in the Paris Agreement, so that will help. Um, but really hugely enlightening, um, and uh, you know, my sense is that um, we'll get there, but you know, we come back to this question of pace. Will we get there quickly enough? Well, it's now time to move on to our next panel. And thinking of moving from short to long term, of course, one of the things is to focus on the people who need long term returns. And then we come to the pension funds. And the next panel discussion, the topic is how can companies align their employee retirement options with their sustainability strategies to achieve greater impact and to remain both a resilient and an attractive employer for future generations. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Bernhardt, who's the US responsible investment leader for Mercer Investments he leads their ESG integration uh, work, uh, working with boards and investment committees of institutional investors, and he's going to set the scene for that next panel discussion. Alex. Somewhere? Just behind you. Take, take one place. Ah. Yeah. Well, while we... Uh work out the, uh, the slide situation, which I presume is being addressed at some point. Uh, I'm Alex uh, with Mercer, an investment consultancy. We have about 12 trillion in assets under advisement globally. I like to uh, brag that we're the largest investor that nobody's ever heard of, <laughs> given that we do a lot of work business to business and not much in the retail market segment. Thank you very much. Um, and I have also noticed that a number of people have gotten up to leave, which I think is you know, what, what happens when we promise to talk about retirement? It's not always the most exciting, uh, exciting subject, but I'm hoping to make it a little bit, a little bit more interesting uh, for, for those of you uh, that are here with us. So the retirement market is a, by some counts, a $40 trillion plus market globally. And it, without, without addressing the retirement savings issue and without addressing ESG in or sustainable finance in the retirement segment, we will not achieve the degree of the level of sustainable finance capital flows needed to achieve the SDGs or, or the Paris Agreement. So it's important that we talk about them in that context. Um, we also recognized in starting some work with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development about a year ago, or a year plus ago now, that there was a, a sort of a deficit of understanding in the retirement space around 
what ESG means, why it's relevant to defined benefit and defined contribution retirement plans. Uh, define the difference there being the defined benefit plans. Uh, employers take the investment risk, and DC plans uh, are where participants take the investment risk. Uh, but in both cases, there, there, there seem to be a lot of barriers to uh, just basically understanding what it means to be a sustainable retirement plan sponsor. Uh, and so we endeavored to draft two different toolkits in conjunction with the WBCSD. Uh, the first one was basic, a basic introduction to a lot of responsible investment concepts. Uh, you know, what, is, what does ESG mean? <laughs> how, does it, uh, how does it get adopted in retirement plan portfolios, et cetera? And then Toolkit 2 was really much more of a tactical, a tactical guide focused on specific actions that investors can take to, uh, to address ESG in, in, their, in their plans. Um, and this included a number of case studies of, of early mover plan sponsors in this in this arena, some corporations uh, like like Bloomberg and Pirelli, who we're gonna we're gonna hear from. Um, and hopefully, it's it's a useful uh, way for sustainability officers, who are some of the primary constituents of WBCSD, as well as plan trustees and heads of HR at corporations, to uh, to use this as a starting point for for getting the conversation going within their within their firms. Uh, but what I want to do to set the stage here for the panel, and we'll have a lot more tactical or practical guidance from, from panelists about how they've addressed ESG in their own retirement plan concept. But what I want to do here today is talk about some of the key barriers that we identified in our research. And I'm not going to cover all of these. I'm really going to focus on, on three. Uh, the performance issue, <laughs> this is over and over again we hear that ESG will reduce performance, and it's just plainly not, not true based on the empirical evidence that, that we have, and I'll cite some of that. Um, incorporating ESG into re retirement plans, uh, some people think that it's a violation of fiduciary duty or regulatory guidelines to do that. Um, there's certainly different market norms uh, across different parts of the, of the world. In, in Europe, there's a, it's a much different regulatory environment than the U.S., and so I'll focus today on, on the U.S. landscape specifically, uh, given that we're here and I, and I focus mostly on the U.S. Um, and also there's a, a perception that none of our competitors or peers are addressing ESG in, in their plans, and that's also a, a misperception. And so we'll talk about all of those here in turn. So on the performance issue, uh, and I apologize to those of you in the sustainable finance field day in and day out, these are well-worn studies <laughs> from, uh, uh, from the University of Hamburg and Deutsche Asset Management and um, the uh, Harvard Business School on, on the right. Uh, so the, the left-hand study there is a meta-analysis that was performed by, uh, by Hamburg and the university and, and the, uh, using PRI information to look at a number of uh, studies on the financial performance of, of ESG uh, and company financial performance, or so the correlation between the two. Uh, and they use a number of different statistical methods to determine which studies showed a positive correlation a negative correlation or a mixed correlation, but overall, looking at over, well over a thousand primary studies on the subject between on the connection between ESG quality and company financial performance, they found overwhelmingly 90 percent plus of the studies showed a non-negative correlation. So what what this means is at at worst, ESG integration or incorporating ESG factors into your investment decision making in a retirement plan or other contexts. Uh, is a neutral factor. It doesn't do anything, uh, and at best, it actually adds value or adds alpha, uh, which is which is great. And while we've had this research for several years, and and while there's plenty of other evidence that that the connection there is positive, uh, perceptions again they they do die hard. Um, and there definitely does need to be you know more work done to look at the connection between ESG and portfolio level performance, uh, and that's and that's coming. Uh, but, but another important area of research, I think, is is the <laughs> the use uh, of ESG as a material factor in determinations of financial value. And historically, materiality determinations have been uh, harder to come by. And so what we're what we're seeing now with uh, with some new research is that as we apply some really well-founded materiality frameworks to the ESG data landscape, which is very diverse and wide, we can actually see a, a much stronger and clearer alpha or outperformance signal. And so what these Harvard uh, professors did is they gathered data from uh, SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and they took ESG metrics uh, underpinning 
those uh, SASB material metrics and applied them to a subset of, uh, of industry, of companies across industries and developed a, a material index and an immaterial index of companies, so companies that perform well on material issues and then, and then companies that perform well on immaterial issues. And they found, uh, pretty interestingly, that companies that perform well on material ESG issues showed as much as 6% alpha over the 20 or so year period uh, that they studied. And so this, this is a, a great indicator that if we spend more time on really nailing down which ESG factors are material to which companies and which sectors, uh, that there's much more value there. Uh, and as, as time goes on and as we get more consensus around which ESG data uh, factors are, are important, I think we'll start to see potentially that, that alpha actually erode as, as markets are, are efficient. They, some of that alpha may be traded away. So there's a potentially an urgency there for early adopters to, to look at this and, and appoint useful investment partners that can um, help make those materiality determinations for them now, early. And so uh, on the regulatory issue, as I mentioned, I, I'd focus here on the, the U.S. The, the issue of ESG has been, uh, for lack of a better term, something of a political football in the, in the U.S. Uh, there was guidance on what was called at the time economically targeted investments put out in 1994 under the Clinton administration. That was completely discarded and replaced in 2008 under the Bush administration by guidance that was pretty, pretty confusing <laughs> to, to sum it up in one word. Uh, in 2015 and in 2016, the Obama administration then overturned 2008, reinstated a lot of the 1994 guidance, and then uh, made some modernizing tweaks to it, so adding the term ESG and some, some more modern references uh, for, for plan sponsors. And generally, that... that DJ. Um, generally, uh, that guidance was pretty favorable towards, towards ESG uh, and allowed for a, a number of, uh, of specific positions for plan sponsors to take with, with clear protections in place. In 2018, the Trump administration issued what's called a field assistance bulletin, which is actually a lesser regulatory document than the interpretive bulletins issued by the Obama administration. Uh, which cost a, cast a somewhat more cautious tone on the ESG issue and made it a little bit more challenging for plan sponsors to move really uh, vociferously in, in the direction of, of ESG integration. But nevertheless, what we, we still have a, really, a lot of really clear areas where action is permissible uh, from a regulatory standpoint. And as we've seen in the past, the things can change <laughs> as administrations change. So uh, one, one thing that's very clearly permissible is adding ESG fund options, standalone ESG fund options, or ESG themed fund options, to use the Department of Labor's terminology, to, to plans uh, is certainly possible. And as evidence of that, I'm going to point to some data uh, which addresses the barrier, one of the other barriers that I said I would talk about, which is that none of our competitors or, or peers are integrating ESG. Uh, and there's a survey done every year by Plan Sponsor, which is a publication that looks at retirement business specifically. And, and they found that uh, as many as 10% of, of DC Plan Sponsors already have a so-called socially responsible uh, fund option in their lineups. Um, it's smaller, certainly, for corporate 401k type plans. Uh, with about 5% overall and only 4% for large plans, but that's not zero. <laughs> and, and importantly, I think it's, it's good to look at the trends. And so here I have some data from our own, our own database. We have done over the last uh, four and a half plus years now, over 20, uh, 25 different searches. So a plan sponsor will come to us as their investment consultant and say, help us find a new manager in this or that asset category. And so we've done 20, 25 ESG themed searches for plan sponsors in the last five years uh, with a pretty significant uptick in, in 2018 and 2019. And so these are all, uh, in almost every instance, this is a plan that didn't have a socially responsible fund offering before. And so we're definitely seeing the trend moving in this direction of more activity and not less. Uh, but in, in saying that, I think it's also important to keep in mind that you can do more than just add an ESG themed fund option in integrating ESG in your in your retirement plan. Uh, you can use it ESG factors to inform asset allocation in your defined benefit plan or to perform, uh, to inform lineup construction in your defined contribution plan. Uh, you can use it to inform manager selection, whether or not it's an ESG themed fund search or, or otherwise. Um, you can use it as a monitoring tool, you know, a different dimension from, from which you can analyze the performance uh, of your investment partners. 
uh, and the list goes on. And so, so that, that's all I had for introductory comments today. I, I do want to turn it over to the panel. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation that we're going to have today about uh, all the different different tasks that they're taking under to uh, to progress ESG in their own retirement plans. Come on up. We love data and evidence. That was great, and it really sets the scene for uh, the panel. Um, the panel is now going to address that question about how companies align the retirement options with sustainability strategies and how they remain attractive and resilient as employers. And it's going to be moderated by Yi Sun, who works at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development on their finance initiative. So Yi Sun, would you please uh, join us on the panel? Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity offered by the Climate Group. Uh, thank you for all the panelists coming here. And most of all, thank you for all of you staying here. We know we are the last panel in between you and the cocktail. But, you know, once we start talk talking about retirement, we're not far from cocktail and beer or, or everything, all the fun there. Um, we have a very stellar panel today. Uh, I want to just uh, let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Jim. Good afternoon. Thanks, Yi. My name is Jim Roach with Natixis Investment Managers. At Natixis, we're a very large global uh, asset management company. What Natixis has done is we've created the first and only sustainable target date fund, a fund built for company 401k, 403b plans to help companies and their employees align their investments with their values. So I've got three different facts today that uh, I'd like to set the stage for, for this, for this conversation. One, did you know that a passive investment in the S&P 500, 500 largest stocks in the United States, that you're investing in a 4.9 degree scenario? So you're going to warm the world by 4.9 degrees by owning 500 of the largest companies in the United States. Is that okay with you? Is that okay with the company and the mission that you guys are looking to achieve? Second, We've talked to our uh, climate industry experts, and they agree with many other out there, it's gonna take a trillion dollars of investments a year to fight climate change, a trillion. So the third part I just want you to think about is, and, and piggyback on what Alex said, there are $40 trillion in the US retirement market. That's pensions, defined benefit, defined contribution. There's over $9 trillion in the defined contribution space. The fine contribution space is known as the 401k, 403b, 457. Any space where you, the employee, get to pick the investment for to help you retire. And out of that $9 trillion, less than 1% of the assets, less than 1% of the assets is invested in ESG. Now back to my second point, I'm not saying that a trillion dollars in environmental social governance screened investing is going to get us to fight, cure climate change but it's a step in the right direction. I hope some of our conversations today are gonna to help add how to increase that 1% of ESG into DC plans. Is it on? Okay. So my name is Maureen Klein. I am in charge of public affairs and sustainability for North America for Pirelli Tire, which is headquartered in Italy. I, am, I also happen to be on the, um, on the committee for the 401k uh, for our U.S. employees. Um, and so I've been very interested in learning all about my fiduciary duty and, uh, and happy to <laughs> talk about how that feels like a parallel universe compared with what we've been talking about all day with the 1.5 degree scenario. Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Ballin. I, I up until about two weeks ago, I was the head of sustainable business programs at Bloomberg. I'm still at Bloomberg, but uh, now I'm the head of business development for a sustainability practice that we're building at Bloomberg NEF. So I'm excited about that because I do believe that there is a huge market, both retail and within uh, the corporate community, uh, for products and services that can make our lives a little bit easier when it comes to an assortment of the of 
projects and reporting requirements that we have out there as sustainability professionals. So, um, but as it relates to this conversation, um, I'm representing Bloomberg. We are the uh, first uh, planned sponsor in the United States uh, to sign the uh, ERISA plan sponsor to, to sign the PRI. Um, we are one of the first companies to uh, provide an ESG option for our employees. Um, and we've been at this for, I think, five or six years, Alex? Yeah, five or six years. So get started now. Even before we say anything wise, it takes a while. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, Lee, Marine, and Jim all sit on the, the WPCSD Aligning Retirement uh, Working Group, Aligning Retirement Asset Working Group. And as, you, as Alex just alluded uh, in the previous presentation, well, we're just giving some more example uh, about that uh, work we have been doing for the past one half years. Uh, we have some slides to show you just to give some more context. So from WBCC perspective, as a business association, uh, we have been seeing the increasing complexity in the retirement space. Uh, company to care more about the rising natural climate risk factor, the aging society, and more and more, the regulatory and corporate culture also added to the conversation there. Uh, to, to answer the concern from our 200, uh, 200 international member company and their 19 million employee working in those company, so we started this working, working group, Aligning Retirement Asset, since 2018. Uh, is, uh, supported by Alias Global Investor, BlackRock, Legal and General Investment Management, Mercer, Natixis, and UNPRI as our uh, uh, project partner. And there's over 30 WBC member company, including Bloomberg and Priority, uh, has joined this effort and begin or already uh, implemented that at the ESG consideration into their investment decision making for the retirement plans. And over the past 15 or 18 months, uh, we, have been we have already produced the two toolkits as an implemented guidance for the company to follow, which are uh, free, accessible online. Uh, for example, you can have some inf information about some overall basic information about governance structure for a typical retirement plan in the company, or get a better understanding of what, is the po what are the possible options you can put into your, your corporate retirement plan for, for your employee. Uh, with that, I think we, can, we want to ask the audience just a two very basic polling question. Just understand where you are, understanding this concept. Uh, if you can put this question out. The, the first question is, do you want a sustainable investment option in your retirement plan as an individual? Probably give audience 10 seconds to answer the questions. First, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. We got seven responses coming in already. Maybe closer right now. Sure. I bet you yeah. go seven for seven. <laughs> All right, just, just do a quick show of hands. Do you want a system option in your, your retirement plan? Overwhelmingly, perfect. Next question, do you have currently a re responsible retirement option in your plan? One person, join us. <laughs> Two? Oh, a few there. Great, uh, so the first question for the panelists based on that response, does that result surprise you? And how do you compare the result from today, the audience here, with your company, starting from Lee? Um, it doesn't surprise me. I think the majority of employers, employees, especially who would attend a client, uh, a conference like this, uh, would want to align their retirement assets with their um, sustainability goals. Um, it also doesn't surprise me that there was only two people who raised their hand saying that they had that option. Um, I'll get into it. We'll get into it much more throughout the day, but it, this is a little bit of a tricky area 
for those with fiduciary duty responsibilities to navigate. It's one of the reasons that I advocate for folks to get a professional, whether it be Mercer or someone else, because um, especially as we're advocating for it, the, the believers in the room, we tend to also be the worst messengers of this type of progressive uh, leadership within a company. You know, if I walked into the investment committee, the retirement committee, and said, we should have an ESG plan, they would say, yeah, of course you do. That's your job, to think that you should have one. But then when you bring in that third party expert, it really helps validate your, your cause for a bunch of reasons that I'm sure we'll dig into throughout the rest of the day, but not surprised by that dichotomy. Uh, there's always the spectrum of believer, uh, the people follow. Maureen, you sit on the committee for making the investment decision. Do you see some, you know, the trend or different breakdown of people on the committee with, together with you? So, yeah, so um, I have learned, and of course I'm not an investment um, expert, uh, but I am on the committee, so I do have fiduciary duty, and I've been, um, so the way the process works is the committee meets quarterly. We have, the company has hired a, um, an expert consultant that works for, uh, for Pirelli and advises us and, and reminds us of what our fiduciary duty is and educates the members of the committee and also reviews our funds on a regular basis and our managers and reports back to us and, uh, and helps us with our fiduciary duty. So what I have learned is essentially that um, the first thing in my fiduciary duty is to keep the fees low. So they consistently remind me and the other committee members that we will be, um, you know, that what are the chances or, or what, what is the litigation climate in terms of um, lawsuits relating to fees. So you wanna, you know, continuously review your, your plan and make sure that the funds are having very low fees. Second thing is um, very, you know, a lot of prudence, high level of prudence, um, sticking to benchmarks, which are these passive funds that you mentioned that have the, the 4.9 degree trajectory. Um, so when, you know, when I did bring it up, and I think I brought it up, and I was put on the committee in 2016, but before that, I had brought up the issue and asked the committee to look at uh, an ESG option. Um, but by the time I joined the committee, I was I was actually educating the advisor, and I won't say who the advisor was, but about what an ESG was and the fact that it, and, and also the other members of the committee, that it was not a trade-off and that there was good performance and so on, and there were options out there. But the option that they brought back to us was a fund that was that had a very broad basket of um, equities that was very close to, you know, a, a broad passive benchmark, and and that was considered the safest option. And then, um, luckily for me, this particular fund has been performing better than the other funds. But then they explained to me that this is because it is heavily loaded with tech stocks, which um, are, have been doing well, but from the minute they don't do well, it will not. And so, so the focus is um, prudence, low fees, um, broad basket, and, you know, and actually they're concerned because of the heavy weight of tech stocks in that, and that might not, you know, the, the the good performance might not last. So it's really, so this is an ESG screen fund, but the focus is completely not about that. Jim, over to you. Uh, Natixis has been doing some research in the space, uh, just gauging the, the demand from market. Is there anything you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. And just jump back for one second on the performance in the opening ceremony yesterday, if anyone attended, I thought it was outstanding. And a number of speakers talked about facts versus opinion. And I deal in the world of facts and facts matter. So any fact I talk about today, I'm happy to show you in a white paper or in results. 
And I think Alex put up a great slide on the myths of ESG and why people are not buying it. And the first one out there is performance. But if you look at the ESG All World Index versus the All World Index itself, so an apples to apples comparison, on the equity side, ESG outperforms on a 1, 3, 5, 10, 15 year period. That's a fact. If you looked at the fixed income side, it outperforms on a 1, 3, 5, 10 period, slightly underperforms on a 15 year period. But 15 years ago, I don't think our data was as great on the fixed income side. So I'm confident, I guess this is an opinion, it's going to outperform on a 15 year period soon. So the, what Alex showed up on that slide is a real reason why we're, you're getting some slow adoptions. But Natixis has done research, um, and we've, we've done a, a survey on Fortune 1000 employees. So every day, think of this as the everyday employee. I got my notebook to make sure I'm saying the right facts. 82% of participants want their investments to reflect their personal values. 74% said they'd like more socially responsible investments in their 401k plan. 71% of millennials said they would invest more or for the first time in their 401k plan if they knew it was doing social good. And 68% of women said the same thing. So there's demand from the participants within the 401k to add ESG options. And there's a couple things I'd like you to think about. Think of your company. And some of you in this room belong to very, very big companies. And I'm going to pick out Bank of America. Imagine how many people work for Bank of America because they were up on stage a few minutes ago. Imagine the line item on a matching a 401k, and it's a benefit to match an employee's contribution to the 401k. Imagine what companies, small or large, match to match the companies, their employees' money into the 401k. That's got to be a big budget. They do that for a lot of reasons. Now, companies have to, what's called a discrimination test. The IRS puts it out there that low earning employees cannot have, you can't penalize them and and reward the high earning employees for a 401k plan. So if the low earning employees are not putting into the 401k plan, the large, the, the people that are earning the most money cannot put the full extent into the 401k plan. So companies match as a benefit. But hey, here's a free idea that doesn't cost the company extra money. How about add investments that people actually want to contribute to? And we're showing results that an ESG investment, even if it's one, two, and it gets their attention to add more into the 401k plan, you're and I'm not telling companies not to add that benefit. I hope they all increase the matching, 401k matching for everybody else. But here's a free idea for them that doesn't cost them any money, give them what they want to do. And I'll give you an example. BW Research, BW Research does a jobs report for the Solar Foundation. Uh, any jobs report you've seen on renewable, uh, the renewable jobs in the US probably came from uh, BW Research. So they added our target date fund in July of 2018. And of course, I got a call at the end of the year uh, from one of the partners who said they did research on the people that added money into their 401k plan. They said that, month, that participation rate went from 57% over a five month period, went from 57% to 100% into the 401k plan. And it was not an auto re-enroll. They did not force everyone into the plan. Monthly contributions increased 230%. And in every interview, as they're a growing company, they talk about benefits. One of the top five things they talk about is they walk the talk. They, are sustain they believe in sustainability. They do research on renewable energy and sustainability across many aspects. But they say, we've added an ESG option to our plan because this is what we believe in. And it didn't cost them a dime. It's what they believe in. And it's what they now, they had to go through little hoops, and we helped them through that. But once they got through the inertia, they're very happy. And that's all the benefits that they, are happy to, to, that they were happy to add in. And they're a happy customer. I can add to that and say that um, it has absolutely become part of our recruitment pitch. So it's helping us attract and retain uh, employees. And we have very generous benefits, but this is something that they put front and center when they're trying to attract someone from a big tech company, right? They can work for Bloomberg, Google, or Facebook. What do we do a little bit differently than those other folks? Um, and it also has attracted a lot of uh, first time participants. And that is a good hook to get your, um, your plan administrator, right? Because they are tasked with trying to get 100% enrollment. It's, it's a, that's a, is a signal that they are doing a good job. So if you could give them a little, another nugget that's gonna get people who are traditionally not engaged in their 401k, which are typically the youngest employees, which 
should be the ones who are saving earliest because they'll get the most money at, at, at the end, but try telling that to a kid. Um, you know, it, this has become a, uh, a value add for us from a cultural perspective and a recruitment perspective. Marie? Can I say one more thing? The, um, I, I, I want to applaud you for introducing a target date fund with uh, the ESG screen because I think that is, um, you know, at, at some point we're going we're gonna to have, companies will have more options and they'll, you know, the advisor will, would, if the advisor had brought to, to our committee a series of target date funds with an ESG screen, I think that would have been a very much more quick and easy way to bring people in because that is, you know, clearly something that draws pe people's attention. You know, this, this fund is designed for my time frame of when I'm going to retire and, you know, it's being managed by a, uh, a good professional it's that's been easiest. selected by my company. It's, it's going to be the easiest, right? So um, I didn't have that option, and I think it would have been much easier if I had. It, so the business case are, are crystal clear here. you got recruitment tool. you got better participation for the plan. A uh, company can walk the talk, lower fee or eco fee and the return are uh, even better or on par with the plan vanilla fund. So let's, let's take the picture a little bit, uh, you know, uh, look at a little bit larger picture here. So we're talking about facilitating investment in a 1.55 degree future scenario. And Jim, you just mentioned the current portfolio are not going anywhere with that target. And company like Pirelli and Bloomberg are WBC's members and RE 100 members. How do you see this, this work, retirement as an alignment, uh, means for the overall strategy for your companies? I, I think it doesn't necessarily fit into our climate strategy. It fits into our broader sustainability strategy. Um, if you're going to go into a clean energy fund, a, a climate fund, that's, a, that's thematic investing. That's different than ESG investing. Um, and I would think that the narrower you make your universe, the harder it's going to get something like that implemented through the firm. If you take a broader lens around ESG, um, you uh, are going to likely address climate, it's the, the big C within ESG, um, but you're also going to be able to uh, help alleviate some of the other challenges associated with maybe clean water or gender or um, a countless number of issues that are out there in the world. Um, but I think it would be wrong to say that uh, an ESG-themed fund is going to specifically help climate. I don't know what our scenario would be if from our fund, which is the Parnassus Core Equity Fund. I don't know if it's, I would imagine it's less than 4.9, but I, but I, I don't have the facts. Um, but it's not geared towards clean energy or, or climate in general. You know, if I could j jump in here for one second. And while I, en I enjoy talking about ESG and what's called ERISA plans or 401k plans because it's very black and white. And the last panel up here talked about thematic, they talked about impact, and, and, and they talked, you know, what is the impact of the funds and, and is it geared towards climate? When you deal with a 401k plan or you deal with ERISA plans, you cannot invest for impact. You cannot invest with pure values alone. As a plan sponsor, plan sponsors, the people in charge of the 401k, they have to take the economic interests of the participant above all else. I'm going to repeat that. They have to take the economic interests of the participant above all else. You cannot sacrifice returns. So people that talk about greenwashing, people that talk about light, it, there's a line that you cannot cross. And, and even some people that talk about divesting in a 401k plan, it makes me very, very nervous, especially with the executive order that Trump put out there. And we don't need to go down this rabbit hole, but, but, it, but I think it helps set up the conversation that there is a line that you cannot cross with ERISA plans. And think about it like this. The government thinks of 401ks, they're allowing you to defer your taxes to a future date. At that future date, they get the piece of your taxes. So they do not want you sacrificing any returns for the future money that they have, especially when people like Maureen have a set number of lineups that they can pick 
they cannot invest in a water fund. That, that was the conversation for the last panel. This panel is ESG in retirement plans, and we talked about $40 trillion or $9 trillion in defined contribution. They're defined rules on what can or can't be done. So ESG comes up to the line. Environmental, social governance, investing comes up to that line. It does not cross that line. And I think that's very important to help understand the fiduciary duty that all the plan sponsors who run your corporate 401k, 403b plan, that is what they face day in and day out. Because if they don't, they're going to get sued with a lawsuit, and nobody wants that. Yeah, so that's that's all absolutely true. I, one thing about performance that I would say is there's, um, I, I feel like we're in a world of disconnects where um, it's, I mean, it's sort of obvious to me, especially if we're talking about a, a longer term, pension funds that are a little bit longer term focused, that why would a fossil fuel uh, investment have good returns, you know, pretty soon, right? And so, I, you know, sometimes I bring that up, you know, are we looking at, um, does it make sense that stranded assets, you know, that with the stranded assets situation, does it make sense that these companies are going to have um, the returns that everyone is claiming uh, is a, the reason that they should be in these funds? You know, I think we're getting... To, when we see the acceleration that's happening with public opinion, with the young people, with um, the the pressure from all fronts that's on companies to um, to switch and to switch to trajectory, I think that's going to have to catch up, and the performance will be part of that. I, I agree. I think it's a very very difficult conversation, and that's when you look at the fine benefit side, when the pensions they have a 30, 40, 50 year time horizon. And, and that's, you know, Alex and Mercer, they get paid a lot of money to make those decisions and consult on those decisions on the defined benefit side. Defined contribution side where the employee picks, a little bit of a different animal, but, but I agree. I mean, it's a very, very tough debate. Um, Cause I agree with you, what uh, stranded assets, but then you get the executive order from Trump that asked the DOL to start investigating any endowment found foundations, uh, a defined benefit plan or 401ks that are divesting. And that just makes that just makes plan sponsors very, very nervous. Yeah, and I, I just, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I wanted to bring back, so there's, the, there's been this debate about um, creating value for stakeholders as opposed to just shareholders, right, this summer. And um, the business roundtable kind of updated their statement. I think that it's, it will become clear to people very soon that you cannot create value for shareholders without creating value for all your stakeholders and without um, cutting your carbon emissions and without having a, um, a climate plan and so on. Yeah, I was just going to add that we truly believe that having this ESG option um, as well as we updated our investment portfolio uh, policy, investment IPS. Tell me what it is, Jim. Uh, Policy statement. Yes. There you go. Investment product statement. That basically says that any new funds going forward, we will consider ESG among many other uh, factors as to whether or not to add a particular fund. Um, we we do this because we believe it's in the long term best interest of our of our employees that these stocks tend to perform less with less volatility, um, and that you generally, um, according to Bloomberg Intelligence funds that include um, or consider ESG generally include higher quality stocks. Um, and if you think about all of us as long-term investors and you look at the long-term investors that are driving this from an asset owner and pension perspective, it makes sense that we would you know, align with these individually with these really big asset owners who have also identified that long-term ESG will, you know, be a better investment, a safer investment. I, I want to ask all of you the final round of question so we can uh, focus on uh, more on the practical side so the audience can take away with the solution. Uh, Lee, Maureen, based on your experience, what are the key successful factor or the, the, the key step you want to share with the audience so they can make this, make an, make this uh, implementation actually happen in the company? What help you to get internal buy-in from your different function in the, in the company? Sure. So um, I would say you need to start now. Uh, it took us 
about three to four years to get this thing off the ground. You, you got to start and benchmark yourself. So we worked with uh, our investment consultant to take a look at our existing funds and say, how are they doing? We didn't look at the exact funds. We looked at the portfolio managers of the fund, and we looked at them on four different criteria, which was, you know, does the portfolio manager generate ideas? Do they? How do they construct the portfolio? Um, what is the what is the business management policy? Uh, you know, uh, policies of that particular uh, of those particular companies that they're investing in, and like, how are they going to implement them? We then kind of took a look and we ranked all of our funds. We found out that we had no super high, perf high performing. We had a few laggards, and then basically everyone else was in the middle. So we took that information. At Bloomberg, you have to measure anything before you kind of go and make a pitch. Um, and we literally handed it off to the, uh, to the investment team. And we said, you've told us that there's an opportunity to add an equity uh, option uh, due to underperformance of a, of a of another uh, stock uh, fund that we had in, in, in the portfolio. We want you to look at ESG, but this is, but we want to give no concessions, right? So for us, no, consen no concessions meant it had to be uh, judged against the same benchmarks that you would look at any other fund. It had to have the same or lesser fees than any other fund, and it had to generate the same returns. And, say, and we told them flat out, if you don't, if you can't find a fund that hits those three criteria, then it doesn't make sense for you to do it. We knew very well that they would find funds that, that fit, fit that criteria. Um, but that kind of set the baseline that we weren't asking them to abandon their fiduciary responsibility or abandon the best interests of our employees Right? We just wanted them to make this on a business case because we believed that the opportunity was there for Bloomberg to take a leadership opportunity and provide this to our employees. I think probably the, um, so that was a great answer and I'm not gonna repeat it. I think in addition, I would really focus on um, sort of grassroots, you know, if the employees want it, then they'll get it. If they go to, if even a couple of employees go to HR, and, and start asking about this. It was interesting to me that last week, Amazon came, came forward with um, energy, renewable energy targets after employees walked out for the climate strike. And so, you know, employee pressure is very real and I think it's, um, I think it's gonna make a huge difference in this area. Jim, from a, as a manager perspective, you work with different kind of client, large corporations, smaller, medium enterprises. What's your experience? I, I, I think what's important is, you know, work with the company's consultant, advisor, whoever on the investment committee and um, challenge them. And, and I stole this line from Lee a year ago, no concessions. You say we want to add an ESG option to our 401k plan, make no concessions on the investment side. It has to hold up to everything else followed in the investment policy statement. And if, you know, for companies that are, people that are interested, your company 401k plan is a public document. It's called Form 5500. And if you're a bigger company, you can go to brightscope.com. You can put in your company name and you can find out who your plan sponsor is. So who signs the legal document and you could walk into his or her office or ask for a meeting you or a bunch of a bunch of you and say we'd like you to add some ESG options into our plan can you please explain the process to us to add investments it is that simple to start the conversation which sometimes took Bloomberg a long time we see companies um, sometimes not taking as long because Bloomberg has paved the way but you know Alex works for Mercer and some of your companies pay Mercer a lot of money to consult and so as you the client go tell Alex at Mercer saying we want an ESG option <laughs> you know, or advisor. And, and, I'll, and I'll say one other quick thing too, is that seven out of every 10 new dollars in a 401k plan goes to the target date. So we were working with um, a Barron's top 50 sustainable company, a fortune 500 company in the US. And I was talking to the sustainability officer and I asked her, do you have an ESG option in your 401k plan? She says, yes. I asked her, I said, do you mind if I ask if you invest in it? She's like, Jim, to be honest, I don't because I don't know how to invest. I don't know how to build portfolio. I just buy what they put me into, which is the target date fund. So that's why we built what we built is because we want to 
move to the way we want to make it easy so people can set it and forget it so young people can invest you know start saving now so they can retire with dignity we the facts are there if you invest over a 40 year period you're going to have more money than you just started i don't think that's a that's a that statement is off the reservation that that is uh there are facts about market returns but the whole key you cannot replace time in a 401k and there are a lot of demands on young people's money. There's a lot of demands on people's money, but the best thing for them is to start early, start often, and this gets them excited about that. So make it easy for them. You can, like a walkout, have a conversation, but all this information is public, and I'm happy to help you add any ESG option with all the conversations that we're having and how to approach your plan sponsor, investment committee, and what the proper procedure is. We have a question from the audience, and by the way, can I encourage more more audience coming from the audience at, the same, at this time? Uh, it's follow up question after your both your you just mentioned on the employee side. What advice can you give the employee who wants this this option? And as a company, what would be the best channel for communication with those, those employees? So part of my fiduciary duty is not to influence employees and tell them which plan to pick. Um, I, um, but, but also part of my fiduciary duty is education. So we need, um, we, we have, there's best practices in terms of bringing the fund manager or the fund, uh, yeah, the management company in to educate our employees and we, we need to do more of that. Um, well, sorry, the question is how to get employee involvement. Right, and what are the, the best channel for communication? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's hard. People don't understand these things. And that's why the target data is so useful. Because um, it's sort of, you know, psychologically, it seems like, oh, they, they know what is right for me, right? Um, but I think, I think HR departments probably need to have more conversations with employees about their savings and and everything else you know how to choose health care even it's it's very confusing all of it um, we need economics in general but then investments I think is very opaque and we 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 really need to move forward in terms of making it simple making people understand what they're where they're putting their money um, absolutely. And I'd also say you have to understand who the point person is. So if it's Maureen here, um, find out who that is and have a meeting. But but I, what I would say to the employee is you must understand the fiduciary duty that she has to all the employees and to the company and to the rules of the law that go with a 401k plan. So if you walk in and ask a number of questions, how do you how do you choose investments? What is the process? Who do you use? Ask a few questions before you just throw, I want an ESG option. So you have to understand what their world is like because it is very, very, very rigid and they don't want a lawsuit. So it is very important to understand um, the question you're asking, who you want to ask it to. Everything's online. So talk to the plan sponsor, um, ask your HR department, but, but go and I'm sure you and others in many companies, I've helped lead many people to the HR department, they had very good conversations, but it was, a starting conversation and the first thing I tell them is ask them a number of questions of how they build the process and what are the rules I had a, a large tech company on the West Coast uh, an employee group uh, reach out they were like uh, I don't know environmental advocates within within the firm uh, they called me they asked me how we went about it they were a ragtag group of employees who are just trying to figure out how they could influence um, their investment committee. They had grabbed the attention um, through just normal conversations and emails, um, and then they were tasked with going to learn the process. And so they reached out to us and at the, get the process. I do believe that that company has been successful in integrating ESG option into their 401k, um, but there's just a long tail, um, and you need to partner. You, you can't jam it down. You have to, under, you know, I think we have to like be cognizant of the fact that of how scary something something new is to uh, a uh, a, a, a member who has fiduciary duty um, within their firm. Um, they maybe have been doing this for you know 20 years. They they don't know what ESG is. You, you really need to understand what your who your audience is, um, and I believe that you know there's plenty of information out there now 
especially comparable to five years ago when we started this, that can enable you to have that initial conversation to find out where their, where their pain points might be. And then you can go back out into the marketplace. You can reach out to us and we'll tell you how we got over those pain points. But your investment advisors are, are probably uh, a really great place to start. And especially when it comes to that, okay, we have it now. How do we let our employees know? Because as Maureen mentioned, she can't advocate, right? So that's a whole nother tricky minefield. So you've, you've cracked the code, you got it in. Now, how do you let everybody know about it without making it feel like they should invest in it? That, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Well, I had another question for probably for Maureen and asking about international perspective. I know we're, we're focused on the U.S. company, the U.S. Regula regulation. Any insight for a non-U.S. company in this effort? Yeah, so of course I did this in the U.S. subsidiary of an international comp company. Um, my experience in Europe is, has been that um, Europe comes from a culture of having had kind of um, more government in intervention in these areas and and is so private pension funds are a little bit newer right wouldn't you say um, definitely there needs to be education all over the world it's not I mean it's not just a US problem I think in the US we are used to having uh, being very scared of lawsuits more than in other parts of the world uh, but but the, this is an international problem for sure in terms of um, people understand, people on the ground understanding the, the whole world of investments. I think, you know, I think people all over the world just got hit by a brick, a ton of bricks when the financial crisis happened and didn't know anything about it and lost half their savings and, and so on and then kind of came back. But there's still, you know, people who are investing today still remember that, and they're still aware that they don't understand it. So it's a, a problem everywhere. Uh, Lee and Jim, any final thoughts? No concessions. <laughs> I do like that one. Um, I, I'd say that piggyback on, on the opening cert, cert, uh, day yesterday, and people talked about take action now. Uh, this is, we don't have time to get into all the great things that ESG is doing, but there are great companies out there that many of you know, some of you work for these companies that are doing great things. You know, look at Target, who 96% of their greenhouse gas emissions comes from what's called scope three of their supply chain. They want to, not only are they going from 25% renewable to 50% renewable, they're also forcing their supply chain to be 50% renewable and 80% of them to be compliant to 50% renewable. Now Walmart, Project Gigaton, but when you have Target and Walmart telling their supply chain to do something, guess what? It happens. When you have other companies in the category that are seeing what Target and Walmart are doing, they're following. We are making a change. And I know we talked about, when I talk about ESG, I talk about the big E, because everything's about the environment, but don't forget the social issues, gender pay gaps, diverse boards. You know, as owners of these stocks, we're holding these chairmen and we're holding these boards accountable to making changes with resolutions. We've said, we're an asset management company. We don't like to talk about the ugly side of the business, but we're not afraid to walk into the, to the chairman of the board and say, if you don't change these two things, you're fired. Because we will get all of our other asset managers to vote against you next, next time your vote comes up. You want to get someone's attention? We fire them. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of great things that, that uh, ESG is doing, but I'd say start now um, and become educated on ESG. All right, thank you, the panelists. And just one takeaway from this session and this working group, uh, we have put together some resource for you to, to use in the future. Uh, you know, the key benefit will be on return and people and strategy. So company can use this as a better investment to further engage and recruit the talent and really walk the talk in the society as a corporation. And more, import more, more importantly, regulate, getting regulation ready for the company. And it's relatively easy, just the seven step guidance for companies want to follow this from uh, evaluate where you are right now, updating your IPS and keep this journey going on. Uh, come to us and join us for this uh, collective effort. Thank you all. Yes. <clears throat>
I'm sure you want to thank the panel and Yisun for that session. Interestingly, there was quite a common theme with the first panel around this whole concept of fiduciary duty. And uh, when I was in the UK government, um, I remember uh, being asked by the minister to uh, call in our energy regulator because they were charged with looking after the interests of consumers. And they were interpreting that in relation to price and security very capably, but they weren't doing a lot on environmental impact emissions. And so they said to us, but you know, in the legislation, we have to look at the interests of consumers. But our response to them was, that doesn't mean the interests today. You have to think of the medium and longer term as well. And so uh, I think without having to change the legislation, we got them to pay more attention. Now, I think there's a similar point in relation to fiduciary duties. And we heard from uh, uh, Suze uh, that perhaps we need a bit of government help to wrap around the framework so that people can take that longer view without fearing that they're going to be uh, hung out to dry uh, because they have moved beyond uh, a very narrow interpretation. And so that could help a lot and it applies to investors and it implies also to um, the holders of funds in their retirement uh, in investments uh, for, the, for their retirement. So that's one point I wanted to make about the two panels, and I wanted to make one other point before handing over uh, to our executive director for North America, Amy Davidson, who's going to make the final closing remarks. And, but it's this. Um, we've heard several things over the course of the last few days about the views of young people in this area. Now, you don't think about your pension until you're 40. You might do in, in some parts, you might do in the US, certainly in Europe, you don't. But the millennials are coming up to that, um, that, that uh, uh, milepost. And so they are going to be interested, and I hope they're going to be interested in relation to their funds, but they're interested in so many other ways. And that's going to feed into an acceleration of the policy response. Uh, and I don't think any company that believes that policy is going to evolve at the pace it used to evolve in this area is on good ground. We've seen quite an acceleration in the last couple of years. And I think that acceleration is going itself to accelerate. So they're just my two kind of personal uh, uh, takeaways, but I really want to invite Amy, who's going to give you a more expert and considered uh, uh, closing remarks. Amy. Thank you. I'm actually just gonna be very brief, and I really just wanted to thank everybody for this session, because it's really important from the climate group's point of view that the investment levers really move much faster than they have been. We talked a lot about the 2025, the 2030 time frame, and if we're gonna get online to the 1.5 degrees, the investment capital needs to move in a very different direction much, much more quickly. So that's really all I wanted to sum up in a very quick moment and to say that we have a wonderful um, cocktail reception out there for everybody. I hope everybody has a chance to network, to thank our panelists. I see Alex there who did a fabulous job and Suze is still here and Joan, our chair of the board and everybody here that stayed for the afternoon and all day. We all have a tremendous amount of work to do, but we're gonna do it together and we're all in it together. And Lee's over there too. So thank you very much for a wonderful day and please go out and enjoy yourself for cocktails. Thank you. Thank you.